glad you're here for this bonus edition of Pilot Talk Podcast, where I am talking to the person who I think has flown more rock stars than anyone else I know. I'll call him, he'll be somewhere else in the world with some other group, and I am always happy to hear what's going on with my friend, Canadian Bill Bryant. Bill, thanks for giving us an inside look into what it's like to be you. How are you doing, Renee? I am doing well. So tell me how you got started in aviation. Let's start there. Well, interestingly enough, I was on a Eastern Airlines flight uh, back when I was uh, 15 years old. So I guess that would be 1980, aging myself now. And my sister and I were invited up to a cockpit and we were talking with the crew and they let my sister play with this one button in the back of the cockpit that lit up a red light that was the APU fire testing. And 11 years later, I was actually a flight engineer on 727 and, and uh, learned what that little button was actually for. That's crazy. So you fell in love with aviation as a teenager because you were invited into a cockpit. That's right, you know, and I knew what I wanted to do when I was 15. And when I was 16 in 1981, I took my first flying lesson. I actually had my private pilot license before I had my driver's license and regularly uh, took my grade 12 and 13 uh, classmates out flying. Most of them have never been in an airplane before. Uh, in grade 12 and 13, uh, I grade 12 I did my grade 12 and 13 English in one year so I didn't have to write my grade 13 English exam I decided to go out and rent an aircraft with a friend of mine who had never flown before and we flew over the gymnasium of the school during the grade 13 English exam and uh, a few of my classmates knew what I was up to but uh, when I got back the teacher said it sounded like a Volvo whipping through the parking lot with no muscle that's fantastic. So do you get in trouble for that or no? Yeah, I got I, I got the uh, finger point at me for that one. That was back in the day where, you know, uh, there's a lot of low level flying going on, but you can't get away with it, stuff like that today. That's for sure. <laughs> well, you can't get away with going into the cockpit in a commercial airliner anymore either. I mean, we've got to find adventures some other way now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's uh, it, Life has changed quite a bit, you know. Um, after I, I started flying for the uh, uh, Beach 18, flying cargo, and I used to fly uh, cargo for auto parts all over North America, Beach 18, no autopilot, uh, flying long, long nights. And that was really before they started bringing in duty day restrictions and stuff. So, I mean, as a young pilot, to put in these crazy hours, you just kept flying until you, you know, nodded off to sleep. I mean, it was. It was a lot, a long, long days. Um, so I was going to ask you that, how you built up your hours in the early days, but it sounds like you were you were flying mufflers around, uh, sounding like you didn't have one on your plane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did that for a few years on the, on the Beach 18, which is otherwise known as the Widowmaker. Uh, very uh, difficult aircraft to fly and a lot of issues uh, with that old airplane. Uh, I flew in the Arctic for six months, uh, all over, uh, even up to the North Pole, Greenland, um, on a Twin Otter and a Hawker City 748. Uh, then I managed to get onto a regional airline flying the Jetstream 31s and ATR 42s back in 1988 89. And then on to the 727 with a small airliner in Toronto. Uh, and that was just before the Gulf War broke out in 1991. And interestingly enough, uh, a lot of airlines shut down in 91 during that Gulf War. And if you recall in history, uh, that's when the fuel prices went up by two and a half times as much. So um, in a very short period of time. So they had their seats sold for the winter season based on fuel prices that were less than half they expected. And a lot of airlines shut down. And I virtually never touched an airplane for about six years after 19. I thought I was out of the business completely. Okay, so then that begs the question, what got you back in? 
Well, I, I managed to go to work for an environmental technology company and the, the boss had a little Seneca 2 and in 96 I started flying it to meetings and uh, I really missed the flying completely and I gave up the environmental technology business and went back to my local flying club where I learned to fly and started flying a small corporate uh, Cessna 421 for a company. And uh, the owner wanted it managed, uh, and I happened to find someone with a operating certificate. And I had the aircraft, and together we started this aircraft management company. And two years later, we had two brand new Citation Excels and a new site, uh, CJ1, and this 421. Wow. So then, where have you gone from there? Because I. I met you after that time and you were flying a little bit bigger stuff then. So how's your career progressed since you started the management company? Well, since that, I, I actually um, went to work for a competitor of mine on a small citation and uh, flew the citation encore for, for many, many hours, uh, starting in 2001. And um, that was a company called Image Air Charter. And, uh, uh, I had just left Image Air Charter about a month ago. They were bought out four years ago and really slowly dissolved in those four years. But when I left in uh, uh, December this last year, I had been there for 18 years and was the longest standing employee there by over a decade. Had flown Citation uh, Encore for about a thousand hours and uh, put about a thousand hours in the Challenger 601, 2,500 hours in the Challenger 605, and uh, spent a year on the Vulcan 7X. Well, when I met you, you were working with Image Air and you were flying in Challengers, and you were flying around some rock stars on tour. And that was just, I, I confess, I lived a little bit vicariously through you chasing chasing where Russia's tour was taking you, but I know that you've flown um, some really interesting people over the years. What have been your challenges and your victories with that? Boy, I think one of the most interesting flights is I went down to um, Washington, D.C., and I picked up a four-star general. I don't really remember the names way back then, but this is, this is going back 10 years, 12 years. And the ex- ousted president of Mexico and uh, he was on board and I dropped off the four-star general and then I had to fly to a little regional airport and drop off the ex-ousted president of Mexico where he had a car waiting for us at three o'clock in the morning in the dark at the regional airport with a pilot assisted lighting system you had to turn on the lights on your approach and landing nothing else in sight and he was he was basically in hiding, um, gotten away from Mexico because he was a recent, recent ousted president of the country and uh, was known for a lot of corruption. And they were looking for him and uh, he happened to be on board my airplane. Crazy. <laughs> That's, that is, that, that, does it make you nervous? You know, I, I've flown to a lot of uh, interesting countries. Um, if, you know, now with all these problems in Venezuela that you're hearing about, in Caracas, uh, those problems did exist back in the early 2000s as well. There were some big issues. I flew down there once and uh, for the first time, and uh, I recall the line handler guiding me into a parking position the park that's Challenger, the Challenger 601 at the time. And apparently he was a new line handler and didn't really know where he was parking me and uh, it was too close or on the president of Venezuela's parking spot for his corporate aircraft that wasn't there. So outruns this 18 year old kid with an AK-47 assault rifle in his hand pointing it at me to the cockpit window. <laughs> And I'm wondering, what am I doing wrong? I'm just parking the aircraft. <laughs> so that was a little interesting. <laughs> there, there seems to be a theme in these interviews that I'm doing with 
airplanes being around AK-47s. I mean, they're just, just, <laughs> we don't have that here in the U.S. necessarily where you're greeted by an AK-47 when you're parking your aircraft, but apparently exists in other parts of the world. But other than that, what do you feel is the most dangerous um, thing that you've ever been involved in, in being part of aviation? Well, you know, I, I've got over 12,000 hours flying and everyone asks me if I've ever had any, any major um, scary situations, you know, and aside from maybe getting into some heavy turbulence, uh, some gusty wind conditions, uh, I haven't really had any, any um, real big uh, problems except for probably my most uh, memorable time was I was flying a Beach 18. If you've ever flown a Beach 18, it's a long tail drag or twin engine built back in the 40s. And we used it a lot for flying cargo. And we happened to have the airplane stacked to the roof full of IBM computers, all still in the boxes. And we landed in Buffalo, New York. And this was in October. So it was starting to get a little cold. Um, and we unloaded these boxes and took off for Toronto and turned the heater on for the first time as we're taking off. And I noticed this glow coming underneath the pilot seat. And I turned around and there's a heater rail in the back of the aircraft with these one inch holes about every foot along the base of the floor of the aircraft where the heat would come out. And there was nothing but flames coming out of these holes. And I turn around and yelled a couple of four letter words and so did the other pilot and we declared an emergency and we pulled the uh, heater handle which shuts off the fuel and air in admission to the Janitrol gas fired heater and landed back in Buffalo without incident. But the issue was, is, is really, you know, what we escaped because if we had turned that heater on when we had it full of cardboard boxes on the previous leg, we would have gone up in flames so quickly full of cardboard boxes. And what had happened was over the summer, a bird had laid its nest in the wing, uh, heater intake in the wing, and you can't see it because it's deep in the wing. And when we turned the heater on a few months later, it sucked the nest into the heater and lit on fire. So now when you see Beach 18s flying around, if you ever get the chance to still see one, you usually see a screen over this intake in the in the leading edge of the wing into the heater for that very reason. Well, I'm glad that it was uh, not a disastrous reason to have a service bulletin on an airplane, but that you were able to avert that disaster. That that would be pretty terrifying. Um, and I guess you flew cold home. Well, pardon me, we flew. You flew home cold. You didn't turn the heat back. Oh on. no! Exactly. No, we shut it off and flew back to Toronto in October. It was a little chilly, but uh, yeah, it got our attention. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, what's your favorite um, favorite place to fly into, or the coolest place that you've ever landed? Well, I, people always ask me that, and I always tell them it's based on 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 the season. You know, and uh, summertime, Europe, I think is is probably most exciting along the Mediterranean. So uh, which airport? I'm going to be real specific here. What's the favorite airport that you've landed in in Europe? Oh, I would think that would have to be the, uh, the, the old um, Nice airport, which is a small strip on the side of a hill. Now you've got the larger down, you know, Nice uh, uh, airport right on the Mediterranean, it's a com large commercial airport. But uh, that would have to be one of the most beautiful areas that, uh, that I have flown to in a, in a very, very long time. Uh, the other, I would have to say Hawaii. Um, it, it, most of the islands in Hawaii are just spectacular. Uh, landing on the island of uh, Malak, uh, I believe it's called uh, Malakai, which is a private island in Hawaii. You have to be a family member to, to land there. And we were actually got permission to land there and, and spend a few hours. And when we took off from, the, from this airport, we flew around the north side of the Hawaiian island of Malakai that had 4,000 foot cliffs straight down into the ocean and crashing waves and uh, vegetation. And we flew 
a thousand feet off the water on the north shore of this airport. With, there's nothing in sight. There's no airplanes. There's no homes. It's 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 a quiet island. It was just waterfalls and it's just spectacular. That sounds amazing. What's been I, the most difficult runway to get in and out of in your flying career? Oh, I believe it would probably be like the East Hampton Airport. Uh, if you've ever been out to the Hampton Island, um, in, in Long Island, New York, out to the Hamptons, East Hampton Airport is a small 4,300 foot runway that's in the middle of the woods. So you basically have to come in there. And I was in a Challenger 601, which didn't break as well as the 605, but you'd come over the treetops and virtually have to duck down and land on this uh, very short, short runway. Um, probably equally as difficult would be the, the old downtown um, Colombian airport in Medellin, Colombia. And that was back in the day before when they allowed us to land there. You can no longer get in there with a the business jet. They don't allow it. But that was back in the day where you had to fly into the valley. It had to be VFR. You had to circle in this valley right next to the hotels, right by the windows of the hotels, crank it around, fly over these uh, houses and land downhill on the short uh, runway in, in downtown Medellin, Colombia. That, that was interesting. I bet. So what do you tell people? Obviously, you get lots of questions about being a pilot. What do you tell young people who are thinking about choosing aviation as a career? Like, what are the reasons to choose? Well, you know, it, it, it can be very difficult on family life. That's for sure. I mean, you have to have a passion for flying. And if you want to get out and truly see the world and, uh, and experience you know, several countries in a, in a very short period of time, you know, being a corporate pilot is definitely the way to go. My, my old boss, I used to fly for, with for 10 years in a Challenger. Um, I used to tell him that I retired when I started flying for him. He, he'd always, every time he got on board, he'd say, Bill, how's retirement going? You know, it, 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 when you do what you love to do and you, you know, you eventually work your way onto these larger corporate jets, um, you're doing exactly what a billionaire aircraft owner is doing, except you're in the front of the airplane and they're in the back of the airplane. Other than that, you're going to the same places and enjoying the same things. Fantastic. What do you think are the most, I mean, you said family life can definitely be impacted by, um, by flying. What are the most other difficult challenges about being a pilot? Staying healthy, definitely. I mean, you can be sitting for long periods of time. Uh, it's important that, you know, you have a, 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 a good regimen, you know, working out regularly, um, getting up out of the cockpit and stretching, definitely. Uh, eating healthy, especially when you get into flights where you have a flight attendant and you know, you're within an arm's reach of the uh, of the snack drawer in the airplane, you know, you really have to uh, discipline yourself. That's great. How about sleeping? Like how many different hotel beds have you slept in, in your life? Thousands and thousands, right? How do you adapt for that? The one thing my father would always tell me was he just can't believe how easily I can sleep. And that really comes with the job where you just have to um, learn how to sleep different time zones and, and get rest and get naps whenever you need them. Because yes, it, 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 it can be, uh, it can take a toll on the body. But you know, one thing I've, I've, I've talked about with our passengers, is really planning the trip so that it is uh, at least, uh, you know, at least of a uh, stress on your body from a sleeping standpoint. You know, when you're flying to Europe, uh, sure, it's it's great to be able to take off at nine o'clock at night in North America and land at eleven o'clock in the morning in Europe, and the way you go. Um, but when you're flying that same distance down to South America. Um, 
why not just go during the daytime rather than the nighttime because you're on the same time zone and that really uh, helps the body to uh, uh, you know not be stressed out about uh, about lack of sleep. Well, it sounds like you do a lot of planning beyond the flight planning, and I'm sure that your um, passengers and employers have definitely appreciated that over the year. Bill, are your kids going to fly? Well, interestingly enough, I had my son, who's a 14-year-old, you know, a real gamer, online gamer. Um, I had him in a an RJ simulator, and uh, he did eight takeoff and landings unbelievable i even gave him an engine failure after takeoff and he handled it just perfectly so he's a, he, he's a natural at it but uh, i think he's going to get into air traffic control he really loves air traffic control and, and i took him for a tour of toronto air traffic control facility last summer and we walk into the place and there's my son standing there in his cargo shorts and flip-flops and we look at 20 aircraft controllers at their desks wearing the same outfit and it's like okay this is perfect for you <laughs> oh my gosh what a, what a great experience that that's a, it's exciting to watch your kids go from from watching you all the years that you're in aviation to choosing something in the same field and it's certainly inspirational um any any crazy things that you want to say that I've left out of our interview today? Well, you know, I, I, I've got a lot of crazy stories. I guess a lot of them I have to stay <laughs> take to the grave. But you know, a lot of people say, uh, "Bill, you should write a book. You should write a book." I said, "You know, yeah, I, I could definitely write a book, but, but you know." <laughs> I didn't want to get a lot of people in trouble over the years, you know, having to write a book. But I've experienced it all from an aviation standpoint. I, I haven't done the the, um, uh, you know, the airline uh, as much as, as, as most pilots have, uh, more corporate. And I think that's uh, one question I get asked a lot is, oh, do you want to go airline, fly a bigger aircraft? But pilots either want to go airline or they want to go corporate. But I can tell you this, Renee, any airline pilot, when they finish that, those 30 years of flying around the world in a big Boeing, the first thing they want to do when they retire is fly a corporate jet for retirement. So I have flown a lot of experienced airline captains in their, in their 70s and uh, that want to just fly. The airline says, you're too old for us, so you have to retire, but you're not too old for corporate aviation. They all want to fly a corporate jet. And it's like, well, uh, I want to do it for my entire career, not just at the end of it. That's fantastic. Well, thanks so much for being with us today on Pilot Talk Podcast. I've appreciated your insights on the aircraft that you've flown and on being a career aviator. Um, you can reach me at Renee Bangelsdorf on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find Bill, and I know his email address now, Bryant at yahoo.ca. Two tricks to that. Bill is B-L-L-B-R-Y-A-N-T at yahoo.ca. So beginning, leave off the I, and make sure you know he's in Canada. And you can follow this podcast on YouTube or on Instagram any of the regular podcast channels if you just want to listen to the audio. Thanks again so much for being with us today, Bill. Thank you, Renee.